moment. Okay. So um, we're live now. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first event uh, organized by the Right Science Club here in Norway. Uh, with me, I have my colleague Anders Nudel Hansen from the Right Norway team, who will be helping me today. Uh, you'll be seeing Anders uh, in the Q&A session. And, and now just a few things before uh, we start with our main event. Since uh, this is the first talk hosted by the Norwegian side, I'll briefly introduce Right Science Club for the uh, newcomers. The Right Science Club is a self-organizing initiative. We host weekly seminars that aim to provide training in uh, reproducible, interpretable, open, and uh, transparent science. All our events are free and uh, open to anyone. If you cannot make a particular event or would like to keep track of uh, upcoming events, please, please uh, check out our website. Twitter, our staff, and YouTube channel. You can also join our mailing list. We'll uh, put uh, we'll put all these links in the chat. And uh, uh, just a bit of uh, housekeeping before I introduce our uh, guest speaker. You can ask your questions uh, in the Q and A message board. The questions will be moderated by Anders and uh, and myself. Uh, and questions will be fed to the speaker at the end uh, of the talk. So uh, now to our main event. Uh, let me introduce our guest uh, uh, speaker to, for today. Today we are joined uh, by the brilliant Flavio Azevedo, uh, who will be talking about measuring ideology, current practices, consequences, and uh, recommendations. Before Flavio starts his talk, uh, I want to say a few words about him and uh, his uh, experience. Flavio is a Fulbright Fellow and a Research Associate at the Institute for Communication Science at uh, Friday Schiller University in Germany. He is currently the principal investigator of the PBBS, a series of survey studies uniting political science and uh, social psychology informing psychological explanations of political attitudes, values, voting, and uh, participation. Flavio did his PhD in political science at the Graduate School of Cologne University, a German excellence center. He will defend his PhD in a few months. In addition to the prestigious Fulbright, Flavio was recently named one of the 100 most influential early career, uh, career Portuguese via the Global Shapers Initiative by the World Economic Forum. The main question driving his research is why do some believe that a nation, people, race, gender, or species is justified in dominating, controlling, and uh, exploiting another? Flavio has also done work on the psychology of neoliberalism, uh, libertarianism, and uh, populism. Flavio is interested in survey methodology, measurement, and uh, meta science. His scholarship has been published in Nature Human Behavior, Nature Communications, Political Psychology, and other scientific journals. And uh, finally, uh, we're especially excited to have uh, Flavio Hepp also because he has uh, co-founded and uh, directs FORT, which is the framework for open and reproducible research training and uh, award-winning uh, grassroots uh, organization aiming to integrate open and reproducible research training and into higher education. And I hope that in the future we can host Flavio again and uh, talk about FORT, which I really enjoy being part of. If you want to know what Flavio is working on, please check, uh, check out his website at flavio.acevedo.com. Uh, you can uh, uh, find the links uh, in the chat. So let's get started. Take it away, Flavio. Um, thank you, Tamara. That was a lovely presentation. Um, hi there, everyone. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the riot organizers and Tamara for their very gracious and kind invitation. Today I'll present a work in progress on the topic of measurement and meta science that deep dives into the theoretical and measurement underpinnings of the study of ideology. We're gonna look at uh, measurement practices, its consequences, 
and um, a few recommendations at the end of it. Um, this uh, research and presentation would have not been possible without my amazing and star collaborator, Delia Balesta. So thank you, Delia. And uh, this presentation is organized as follows. We'll first have the briefest uh, introduction to the study of ideology, just in case uh, some of you may not be aware, more or less, where uh, or how we study ideology. Then we're going to look at the motivations for our research and provide a summary of the presentation. So from the get-go, you know where we'll be heading towards. And then um, we're going to review the presentation's principal claim, and we're going to go over our methods and results of two studies. One is a systematic review of the literature, and the second one is an empirical uh, study showing uh, the, the performance of these scales. And finally, we'll have a presentation uh, in the end about some solutions and approaches that uh, we found to be useful in uh, mitigating the, the issues that uh, we identified, as well as uh, hopefully suggest ways uh, to have a more um, cumulative science. So this is the briefest uh, introduction to the study of ideology. Um, so ideology is a key construct across social sciences and the humanities. Um, it's the key uh, topic on numerous research disciplines, uh, ranging from even genetics. There's papers published in physics journals, uh, and it's used as a predictor, a covariate, as well as to enroll participants into research. So and generally, uh, there's three main approaches to the study of ideology. We're gonna focus on one, but just to paint, paint a picture. Um, the first one focus on the etiology of, and ideological content of ideologies. Basically think of families of ideology like uh, conservatism, liberalism, libertarianism, anarchism. Uh, and th there's a second uh, current that looks at uh, how ideology gets communicated. So the mediums through which ideology is expressed and looks at institutions, how it's expressed, cultural symbolisms. And the third part on which we focus looks at, uh, at, at the quantitative behavioral dimension of ideology, which is looking at ideology uh, taken explicitly as it's known to its bearer, so us at the individual level side of things. And then um, ideology study in two ways, mostly um, political elites, um, so that is politicians, uh, 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 intellectual elites as well, um, so people who write in the New York Times, for example, um, as well as the mass public, right? And um, Ideology has two main facets. So there's two ways people go about it, to study it, how one identifies. Uh, so, oh, I'm conservative, I'm a liberal, I'm an anarchist and so forth. And also via uh, policy preferences, which is called operational ideology, which we're gonna hear a lot today. And that depends on your political interest, on how much knowledge you have about politics. And you may have one, two, three, four or five uh, uh, dimensions. All right, with that brief introduction. So here's uh, uh, the motivation for this study, right? Um, the importance of ideology begs the question, how are researchers studying ideology? How are they measuring it? What are the current practices? So to our knowledge, to our knowledge, there's no yet, there's not as of yet a study analyzing um, uh, these practices. And uh, what we did was to look at over 400 articles published across social sciences to look at how we've been doing this. And we found four results, uh, main results, if you will. Um, first, um, so there's a lot of heterogeneity uh, in how ideology is measured. Second, uh, on top of this heterogeneity, there doesn't seem to be too much overlap between the different scales that we found. So think of uh, some measure LGBT rights, immigration, welfare state, 
health care, abortion, and there are many, many topics, and they don't, uh, these topics don't overlap across scales. So meaning that different scales are measuring different attitudes in a way. Uh, third is that um, when, uh, even when using the same instrument, so sometimes th there are scales that people use in time, for example, if you ever measure ideology, it's very possible that you came across uh, um, Wilson and Patterson scale. Um, so that's the, the, say the most famous scale. But even when we use the same, we vary the way we measure it, how many items we include, the scale points, we deviate from researchers' recommendations and so forth. So you can imagine that it's not exactly um, easy to establish a comparability between even uh, uh, results from ensuing from the same scale. And fourth, and perhaps more importantly, uh, when different scales uh, they are used to test established uh, research findings uh, in political science, political psychology, social psychology, uh, we show and we will show in this presentation that um, results can change as a function of the scale used. So if you use scale A versus scale B, you will find potentially different results on the same people. Meaning that if, if you had surveyed, normally people survey just one scale and not two or not three, they would uh, correctly assume that this is uh, a, 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 a practice that is prevailing in our uh, field. And perhaps they will find a, a, a result that is uh, coherent with theory or against it, and we will never know because there's just one instrument. So what we did is to survey several of these instruments and we will show that results can change. So the substantial heterogeneity uh, of ideological scales, the low overlap, how and how they, these, uh, they can change results, um, sort of point to the threat of replicability and the lack of generalizability in this field, right? So the main takeaway of this presentation, and I know I'm on the first five minutes, but I like to uh, always tell the, the, the audience where I'm leading them uh, <laughs> to see if we can convince them that this is the case. Um, so the main takeaway of this presentation is that we've been conducting research on ideology, but uh, it's my guess that it's not a particular problem of ideology and also may generalize to other topics, as if we we're all using all in the same measure, a single predefined, pretested, cross-nationally validated uh, ideological measure. So we're currently doing research as if we're all using a standardized measure. And the problem is we're not. So we're gonna discuss the implications of this problematic practices and conclude with recommendations. All right, so here's a fancy way to say what I said before. So the findings of political behavior and the psychology thereof in the sciences, social sciences like political science, social psychology, political psychology, as well as the perseverance or the long-standing debates about polarization, whether or not we are polarized, uh, whether the public is ideological, whether there are ideological asymmetries, meaning that people have uh, that are attracted to different ideologies depending on their psychology, the social and economic roots of psychological uh, uh, endorsement, etc. All of these are in part, and I would argue a lot, influenced by this idiosyncratic selection of measures and our measurement practices. So let me walk you towards. Uh, this journey and see uh, by the end of it if you agree with me. So the status quo today, the routine practice, is to measure ideology with one instrument only, which can vary widely from one another in content, number of items, scoring system, dimensionality, and so on, but draw conclusions about ideology in general, relying on the assumption that these measures are interchangeable. So the standard pack practice is to tacitly assume that ideological inventories can be used interchangeably. So we conduct the research on one ideological instrument. Uh, so for example, if you're using the American National Election Study, the European Value Survey, the General Social Survey, but we draw conclusions about the nature of ideology in general. So, <clears throat> 
this matters because should this tacit and untested assumption of interchangeability not hold, that is, if we swap one ideological instrument from another and the conclusion changes, this poses a threat to comparability of existing findings. So that's when you're trying to uh, make sense of uh, existing studies. Uh, the robustness and replicability of findings, that's when you're trying to understand the difference between studies. And hence, that affects the generalizability of findings. So all of which uh, sort of negatively impacts our ability to accumulate knowledge and move our science forward, right? So it's dependent on the variability that we're going to find that we can sort of adjudicate the extent to which these long-standing debates that I talked about may be a function of the lack of good measurement practices and the use of different idiosyncratic measures. All right, so in order to operationalize the predictions uh, that I have, my principal claims, I will present to you two studies. So first I said that there would be high heterogeneity in ideological instruments, content and measurement practices. And then I said that substantive findings change as a function of the ideological measures. So one refers to literature and the second one refers to data. And the way we assess it, the first one is through a systematic review and the second one via a survey study. All right, so we reviewed the literature and to investigate the measurement practices, we first uh, um, selected a number of heterogeneity indicators. So number of unique measures, nobody dated measures, on the fly measures. Um, another one is a low number of existing uh, validated or updated measures, non-uniformity and lack of continuously updated measures. Uh, indicators of quality that's regular and, and typical on validity studies. So, but incomplete reporting of response code, transformations, techniques used, dimensionality score, scale type, number of items, etc. Even procedure, right? Um, and then um, I wanted to just make a, a, a I'm sure that I talk about scope a little bit. So there are many ways in which people measure ideology and we're looking only at operational ideology. We collected information about everything else, but here in this presentation, we're just gonna focus on operational ideology, which is by far the most um, frequent way in which people operationalize ideology. So um, that's our scope. All right, so when it comes to um, information, we collected several meta information, so author, scientific discipline, year, uh, sample specifics, so or national origin, sample size, type of sample, study specifics. Um, so I'll just uh, go through them, uh, measurement specific information on construct validation and so forth. So this is our um, uh, sort of metadata database that we built. All right. So the way we went about uh, our literature review was following Webster and Watson, but there's many other examples and it's called forward and backward research, uh, uh, literature search. And we started with the seven articles that we thought represent um, a good uh, um, a variety of scales within the field. Some of them are from political science, other from communication studies, other from social psychology. Some of them have uh, completely been developed, like for example, like Everett, others have been not developed, literally come up uh, with a scale on the spot as per the authors themselves. Uh, so uh, that's, that's uh, what we used to go through the literature. And in, we identify 136 via backward uh, search. That is to say, we took um, the references that were cited in the seven works and forward search, we found 258 articles. And that is to say the articles that cited this research. All right. So we identified a total of 394 articles. And given uh, a few of exclusion criteria, for example, they use no ideological measure, we couldn't access it, they use only symbolic ideology, 
or RWA and STO, which are psychological constructs rather than ideology. So excluding those, we have a final set of 207 uh, uh, papers in the end. So when reviewing the literature on your right, you will find a plot of all the scales we found. So every color sliver that you're finding is a different scale. And you will see that the width of each one, some are thinner, some are thicker. It means how many times they were uh, surveyed. So you can see here, well, let me see if I can have a laser pointer, yeah. This one is the Wilson and Pattern C scale, and you can see by the width of the segment that it's the most used, followed by the unnamed, so people don't name their, their scales. All right, so the major finding that uh, we will show, or that we are, is that more than 75% of these measures that we found are unique. That is to say, that three out of every four papers that are published use a unique measure. And that just signifies that there's lots of heterogeneity, right? And we find like some curious things like Wilson and Patterson indeed is the most prevalent followed by uh, cultural conservatism and economic conservatism by De Vita followed by mid and dwarf scale of social uh, and economic ideology. All right, so here's another result. We're looking at the trending time. And as we know, publishing, uh, we're publishing more and more research. And perhaps as a consequence, we're publishing more and more scales. And given the current practices of using on the fly uh, measures, it means we're gonna increase the number of measures even further. I wouldn't pay too much attention on the curve. Uh, it, it sort of signals an exponential growth, but there's reason to believe that this is more uh, idiosyncratic of our study rather than uh, 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 an actual uh, increase, probably is a linear increase. In any case, um, these we wanted to speak about where these um, uh, scales have been published, and I hope you can see it is published on top journals. So for example, in political science, you have AJPS, GOP, American Political Science Review, which are top journals. Those are the most frequent. And in psychology, you have a PID, or Personality and Individual Differences, um, uh, the Journal of Social Psychology, Political Psychology, Journal of Personality, Social Psychology, the uh, personal uh, Personality and Social uh, uh, Bulletin, um, and so on. So this isn't being published at outlets that are not, say, uh, um, symbolic of the field. In our literature search, we found that scales are more prevalent in psychology than political science, and then we cluster other disciplines together that have things like communication science, marketing, economics, sociology. Uh, but this is more of a result of our um, research. So this is, we're not generalizing this. Uh, and it's very likely that political science has as many, as much of a problem than, than psychology. All right. And uh, now we move away from, okay, there's lots of heterogeneity uh, out there. There's many unique scales and we're, incrementing uh, the, the, the literature with more and more scales. And we go to, okay, there's many scales, but perhaps they are all measuring the same thing. Perhaps not always lost, we are not hopeless, they are talking about the same topics and therefore while there may be some differences, they are, they are all tapping into the same construct. So we added a few scales, so we have 10 in the end, and uh, we conducted a content analysis, right? So these 10 scales amount to 202 items, and in these 200 items, we found 60 unique topics while using a relatively conservative approach uh, to broad categories. And in the table, we see what is called a jo Jocker index matrix, 
Um, and this is a, a, a Jaccard index is a statistic that uh, is used in understanding similarities between sample sets. And what you're looking at is basically that it goes from zero to one. And what you're looking at is evidence of very little overlap between uh, the items that are inside these scales. So the average Jaccard index is 0 0.1, right? So it is not great. And this is another plot that is uh, sort of visualizing that correlation matrix. Um, it was a, 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 it's a plot provided by Eichelfried, um, one of the pioneers in measurement. And, and here on T1, let me see if I can get a laser pointer. Yeah, okay. Here's on T1, it's correspond to this line of the table and so forth. T40 is here. So this is just the topics that were found. And you can see that abortion T1 is found across scales. So there's a frequency of nine out of the 10 scales. So there's a 90% content overlap, but you can see that from nine, it goes to six and five, and then it goes down to three, which is your sort of uh, 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 median, uh, sometimes less uh, 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 overlap when it comes to content between scales, right? So they are really not measuring the same thing. Um, and this poses a problem uh, to the extent of, are we measuring the same? Uh, uh, construct with these different scales. All right, last, this is point number three, is that even when using the same scale, in this case, Wilson and Patterson scale, what you're looking at is how different we've gone about measuring the same scale. So on your left, you have here the ears, in which uh, uh, scale using this, the C scale, the Wilson and Patterson scale, were published. Then here we you have the science on which uh, it was published, whether it was uh, an adaptation, how many items it used. So the original scale used 15, 50 items, and you can see there's some that use more, undisclosed all the way to 13 items. And then when it comes to the measurement part of it, which we know it's an important aspect, it goes everywhere from a nine uh, point Likert scale to 10 percent steps to varied forms, yes or no scoring. And then when it comes to a final score, it has been shown by binomial using means, undisclosed and sums. All right, so what we learn here is that unfortunately, even when using the same scale, um, which we, we found 50 instances of, um, very few times uh, uh, the scale was used as it was validated, right? There's good reasons for it. Um, ide ideology moves forward in time and the items of the C scale may no longer be valid on its face validity. So this is not necessarily a bad thing. However, I hope to show that the variance with which we've been measuring is reason for concern. All right, so let's make a summary. So we found 152 individual measures in a sample of 207. Uh, that is a lot of variance. That's 75% of unique measures. We found very low content overlap between ideological scales. We found uh, substantial heterogeneity even within the same scale. Altogether and overall, scales vary in content, issue representativeness, item format, number of items, dimensionality, and so on. We found also that there is lack of validation evidence. So less than half of measures were validated and factor analytical speci uh, specifications are rarely reported. So when analyzing the meta information that we were able to collect, there's huge variance between 
uh, and within scientific disciplines, and uh, incomplete reporting is wild. So there's three consequences for this. As I've mentioned in the beginning, comparability is a problem between these scales given their lack of content overlap and how many unique scales there are. This poses a problem to generalizability and reproducibility. And as a consequence, we have to ask ourselves uh, to what extent are we building cumulative science? All right, so this is the end of study number one. And you, the viewer, can ask the following question. Does it matter? I mean, does it matter practically? If you do research that involves ideology somehow, it's not your main interest, for example, uh, and you use one ideological measure, or you create one on your own, or you use items from an existing survey, say AES, GSS, any, any uh, sum or mean of policy preferences. Would these choices possibly influence the findings you have? So to answer this question, uh, we uh, collected, I'll come back to that slide in a second. We collected uh, a nationally representative sample using a professional survey company, quota based representative, and there is an exploratory and a confirmatory sample in the months preceding the 2016 elections. And we control for careless, carelessness and satisfying, uh, consistency checks, time checks, page, et cetera. And we were able to have. Uh, some replications as well. So uh, with this study design, we hope to uh, sort of establish empirically um, to what extent are ideological instruments interchangeable, right? So are they all equally good indicators? Do they present equally desirable val validity preferences? Can they be used interchangeably to arrive at the same results? All right, so we used uh, a total of 63 items, and the scales are the same as previously shown. There's five scales, and we're going to test four theories. So we tested seven in the end, um, and we're happy to take your suggestion for theories to test. Um, but here we're going to just show four of very established findings in political science and social psychology that shouldn't be uh, surprising to anyone, and it's easy to operationalize and explain. All right, I hope. <laughs> All right, the first one is the famous study by Allison and Stimson uh, from 2002. There's a book called Ideology in America, in which uh, it is said it is positive, and this is widely replicated, so this is not super, it's not about replicability, whether that replicates or not, but whether an instrument is able to replicate it. So the, the claim is that Americans are symbolically conservative and operationally liberal. What does this mean? So symbolically conservative has to do with your self-identification. It is tied to your identity, how you see yourself. So you just ask them, um, um, folks like to put themselves into a very liberal, to very conservative, very right, or strongly on the right or on the left. All right, that's symbolic conservatism. And operational conservatism or operational ideology is just when you ask them opinions about policy preferences on abortion, LGBT rights, uh, the items that we saw on uh, the content uh, analysis that we did above. So, well, the expectation here, and I'm gonna use the pointer here, is that uh, the population, so measuring the same people, right? So this is the same people, this is the distribution. And people would hold, uh, when, when you ask them about policy preferences, they would hold a more liberal uh, opinion than when you ask them how they feel about their own views. Does that make sense? So if you ask somebody, um, the average American, probably they would say, Slight moderate or slightly conservative. However, when you survey their policy preferences <clears throat> with an average uh, operational ideology scale, they are mostly liberal left. Okay, so that's the claim. And indeed, um, here 
what we are looking at is that we are able to replicate these findings with a scale from Zell and Bernstein that was also used in Peer Research Center. And you see on your left here, uh, operational ideology on the left, meaning Americans when asked about policy preferences are more on the left, but on the symbolic ideology, they are more on the right. And you can see this by these dashed lines. All right, here's the surprise we can invert this with another scale. So this is another scale by average 2013. And it shows that you can actually have an operational scale that yields more conservatism as uh, uh, in the same people than the symbolic ideology items, right? So this completely appends and we call this a reversal Right, so it's when we find the opposite result. It's not a no result, it's a reversal. All right, so this is our all scales together. So what we would expect, uh, what we are looking at here is that average in this case would yield a reversal and that's why I colored it uh, a purple. Uh, Feldman and Zell and Bernstein would agree with uh, Ellison, Stimson, and uh, Hennigan, and uh, in Barb, Zara, and Bloom would yield a no result. So basically, out of five scales, one shows a reversal, two agrees with the original findings, and two uh, 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 would be a no result. All right. So here we show that a scale that you choose on your study may impact significantly the results you find. All right, let's move to our second case study. I see our host Amara is laughing. I hope she, she finds this very enjoying because it is a finding that uh, it, it's, it's astonishing really. I, I find, it, I, I was very astonished to find this, but I'll show you this three more times. So four in total. All right, so here you have um, another claim, which is that Americans are not yet ideologically polarized. And this, this was made, uh, this is a, a study by Leukish on Public Opinion Quarterly, a very respected outlet in political science. Um, and basically this is done, so the graph that we're looking at is not data, but the expectation. What does one expect to find? So if you have a hedges G, hedges G is like Cohen's D, the same thing, but has a correction for sample bias. Then you have a bimodality coefficient and a Hardigan's test. Uh, so we, we do these tests here of, and because they are so overlapped, um, uh, we find a p-value of one. So meaning that there is no two distributions, there's just one distribution between uh, Republicans and Democrats, right? So a moderate polarization would be when these distributions are a little bit apart. Um, you have a Hedges G of 2.4, an equivalent of a Cohen's D of 2.4 between two groups, and you have a p-value of less than one, but still not significant. And when you have high polarization, you have a hard and steep test, meaning there's two distributions uh, that is significant and a Hedges D of 3.9. Now, for psychologists that are watching this presentation, please be aware that these effect sizes are monstrous, right? We're, <laughs> we're used to look at effect sizes of 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and so on. So, Polarization in political science is operationalized very conservatively. Conservatively, I would even argue that this is not a great. Uh, this is a far too conservative test for polarization. But uh, uh, the author, uh, in this case, found this to be relevant. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll I, I just tested the way that they tested, right? So not to have my own analytical choices influence the results of the findings. All right, so these are the expectations. Let's see what we find. So basically what we are finding is the following. Um, whatever the p-value is non-significant, we would find the same results as the authors did. So if you take uh, Everett and uh, Hennigan's scale, you will find the same result as 
the original author. And in purple, you would find the opposite. So Feldman and Johnston, and Bar Pizarro and Bloom, and Zellbar and Stein Scale would find different results and different distributions, uh, uh, on polarization between uh, uh, Republicans and Democrats. All right, so that's the second finding that, you know, um, I showed that uh, there is dependency on the measure when one's testing theories. All right, so here we have a third study. This is by yours truly. Um, it's a paper published at Group Processes and Peer Groups Relations, and uh, it's called Ideological Basis of Scientific Attitudes. And in it, uh, we predict that ideology uh, predicts distrust in climate change far and above other variables. This isn't particularly, um, um, not consensus. This is not a, a not a, a very non expected finding. But what is expected is that we conducted a mode two first analysis, and so that is to say we ran every possible model with fifteen variables, trying to look at which variables would survive most often as the main predictor of uh, 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 distrust in climate science. And what you see here on your right panel is that this scale here, which is Alan Bernstein and Ingvar Pizarro and Bloom scale, they are consistently and always a predictor of distrust in climate change. The, the finding for this particular paper is that there are other scales that are not. So they bear nothing on uh, predicting distrust in climate change. So this is analyzes the universe of possible models. So we estimated, I believe, was it 200,000 models? I should have that number memorized, but it's a lot of models there. And what we're showing is that the distributions of the, 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 the beta coefficients of the ideological scales predicting distrust in climate change vary significantly uh, 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 depending on which variables are in the model with the exception of Zell and Bernstein and Ingvar Pizarro and Bloom, which are always predictor of uh, distress and climate change. This is the third study. And the fourth study is more of um, um, a trivial, trivial thing. It has no statistical test, but I believe you can see this uh, visually and with proportions, but it's basically on the case of the libertarian, uh, how, how, how many libertarians there is in the United States, uh, especially with the rise of populism, this became, um, um, a, a very popular graph. We in political science would say that this is probably the most popular graph uh, in ideological research. And basically it's showing that there's very few libertarians which would be socially liberal, but economically conservative, and they would be here. So each dot is a person. So they are mostly on other quadrants. All right, so if I move forward, my main goal is to show that the proportion of people on this quadrant would be different depending on the scale that you use. And this ranges not from 3.8, I think the, the most, the, the, the fewest we find is five or 6%, and it goes all the way to uh, 20%. So there's quite some variability there. So we get at the summary of the presentation, so the main takeaway of this presentation is that we've been conducting research on ideology as if we're all using one and the same measure. A single predefined, well-tested, cross-nationally validated, and as if we all uh, also share the same theories about ideology as well. Um, so we do as if we are using a standardized, me a standardized measure, but we are not. And this is what we hope to have shown you in the last two studies. Um, and the problem or the implication is that it may lead to results being idiosyncratic to the particular scales that you're using or the operationalization uh, that you are using. Uh, uh, and this poses a problem to the replicability, obviously, uh, and the generalizability of this research. So, when it comes to taking stock, um, it's important to notice that 
uh, these characteristics have been associated with increased uh, risk to failure to replicate. Uh, and we've even seen a few reversals in our, uh, in our empirical study. Um, the research on ideology is riddled with jingle jingle fallacies. And just in case um, um, you don't know what that is, it's just the erroneous assumption that two different scales are the same because they bear the same name. That's the jingle fallacy, um, or two identical, uh, or two identical, or most identical scales are different because they are labeled differently, and that's called a uh, jingle fallacy. Um, and three, that altogether, in reviewing more than four hundred articles, we speculate. We can only speculate that it is unlikely that these measures of ideology are equally uh, good indicators of ideology, present desirable validity preferences, and can be used interchangeably. So there's an important implication for this, in particular to the prevailing view of the influence of ideology in the scholarship, is that the, if the basic measurement of ideology is flawed, it's likely that the insights from that research into whether people are ideological or not, whether they hold ideological beliefs, can, can they be trusted? And we believe that these findings would say that, no, they cannot, because without a reliable measurement, the level of ideological thinking probably uh, is being underestimated. And the relationship between ideology uh, and individual opinions is probably more complicated and contingent than they appear. And that has major implications for the field of political science and social psychology, where the prevailing theory is social identity theory. You identify with a party and that influences uh, your opinion the most. So this, uh, the implication is that the difficulty in measuring ideology, which is more uh, arguably more difficult, uh, a, a more uh, um, laborious endeavor than measuring uh, uh, social identity, um, which is often a one item measure. It's a symbolic measure anyways. So it's probably their implications to that, uh, to that uh, literature. All right, so there's a few recommendations that we uh, would like to tell you about before finishing is that as is common in political science and sociology, we believe that there's need or there could be a push for institutional effort towards standardizing measures with specific purposes, right? So not a golden measure that fulfills every purpose, but perhaps a standardized measure uh, which are continuously updated by one organization whose properties are known and replicated. So it's it's, the goal is to have institutions that can uh, survey a given country uh, and analyze its properties, dimensionality across surveys and publicize these findings uh, uh, and it, these scales properties across, say, uh, are they invariant uh, across groups, populations in time and et cetera, right? I'm not sure whether it's possible to get all this into one, so perhaps that's why I say with specific purposes. Another way to go is to qualify research findings based on ideological topics. So instead of using scales to talk about ideology, um, um, if, you, if you don't feel like developing your own instrument, so you try to generalize to ideology via saying, look, these findings work for LGBT rights, for abortion, for uh, uh, government size, et cetera. So uh, uh, an array of issues. Yet another approach is the theory-based approach in which um, the focus is on theoretical clarity and try to limit the scope of ideology to a range in which it can be measured more accurately and still be developed on. There's also, Another aspect in which you can use methods to try to uh, analyze the stability of your findings through, for example, sensibility analysis 
or multiverse analysis that was our option in example three, uh, but also uh, test equating methods in which you use items whose properties and, uh, are known against your own scale and you can compare them. All right, we have two, we arrived almost at the end and we have uh, two questions or two sets of questions. So please help us improve our work. So if you think that there are theories that we can test, let us know which instruments you would like to see highlighted or see if we coded them uh, and suggestions on how to solve this heterogeneity, high heterogeneity problem, let us know. We uh, are very much looking forward to your feedback and also join our group, Go Team Science. So if you have an idea uh, that you think is worthwhile uh, going after and test it out, uh, send us an email. And if you want to help us code more scales, because you think this is a, a valuable uh, endeavor, let us know. Of course, you will be credited. Um, send us an email. That's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Uh, thank you for your time. And a special thanks to Dina Valesta, our, my star collaborator, who has, uh, without whom this project would never be done. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much uh, for this lovely talk, uh, Flavia. And um, uh, yeah, I see that uh, we've got a few questions. Uh, Anish, can you please uh, read those for Flavio? Yes. Um, thanks. Thanks, uh, Flavio. Great talk. Uh, a few questions. Um, um, we have two from um, uh, Dr. Kogo Moreira. Um, uh, a colleague of ours at Estonia University College. He uh, he uh, writes. Congrats for the wonderful presentation. I have a question. Um, if I understood correctly, by using the Jacquard index, uh, your group created a pool of items to assess how the different sim slash similar scales are to each other. Uh, is there any study evaluating how similar two scales, for example? They are disentangling traits, the scale is supposed to measure and the effect of the scale uh, per se, like a multi-trait, multi-method design. If I understand right, uh, MTMM is used when you have individual level data and you're looking at convergent and divergent validity. Um, this is a little different than looking at content overlap of the item in which you're trying to assess the extent to which the content of each item within a scale is similar to the content of an, the items of another scale and so forth. Um, but uh, looking at MTMM for uh, the empirical data is a valuable endeavor and we hope to arrive uh, uh, there at some point. However, um, what is most important uh, for this research is to understand that Bavaria correlations, even using this method, may be somewhat uh, too simplistic because inferences in theory are based on conditional probabilities. So several measures, uh, several constructs in a model. So looking at just uh, um, specific Bavaria correlations is, in our opinion, a little problematic when the inferences that we made or the, the stick by which we use to uh, assess validity is a little more complex than that, if that makes sense. Thanks. Um, the, the second question from uh, Dr. Kogo Moreira is, um, in your literature review, uh, how often do researchers use confirmatory factor analysis, item response theory, uh, measurement invariance, and other psychometric features under latent variable approach? All right, so I didn't go through much detail on this. Uh, uh, Ugo is correct, um, but it's, you know, it's, there's a given time to present, um, but we found, very few instances um, of invariance. I think I recall one or two in 200 papers. There may be more, I may be underestimating it, but we're talking about less than 5% for sure. 
IRT, I recall a few papers um, uh, that are very important to the field, but that's all, they are probably four or five. Um, so, so no, measurement is not taken, uh, unfortunately, uh, in a, it's, it's, not, it's not the way that scholars have so far uh, uh, tried to address the issues. So, so possibilities there too. Oh, for yeah. sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, 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 next question. Um, sorry if I pronounced the names uh, incorrectly, but David Kalkun, uh, 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 it says, is it really appropriate to use, to cite p-values for non-randomized studies? Uh, oh, David. Um, Yes, I, yes, I don't want to get into any um, p-values uh, contention or debate, but um, in my master's in statistics, I was taught that, yes, it is uh, appropriate. Probably there are boundary conditions for such, but I don't think that is much of, um, is much of a, debate well yeah otherwise very few social science studies would uh report any p-value sure. yes thanks we, we have uh, another question from uh, elizabeth winkler lawrence um could you elaborate a little more on efforts to standardize theory-based approaches how much is the discrepancy in even define uh even define the uh, the term ideology uh yeah yeah thank you elizabeth for your question um so this um uh, your question gets to the heart of the presentation and i believe sociology the field of sociology uh, and political science, they are more advanced when it comes to collecting data centralized and be able to have several uh, surveys collecting different sets of questions and they have their own uh, uh, expertise, so to say, but they all bear on the topics of, of ideology, partisanship, uh, social and values, uh, so social attitudes and social values. Uh, and I believe, for example, psychology could probably uh, benefit from such, uh, such a, a, a nationwide survey, for example, in different countries. And these institutions, for example, American National, National Election Studies is one, uh, uh, General Social Survey is another, but there's, there's many, there's voter study group, which is not tied to any particular uh, uh, say, uh, almost, I don't know, research institution, although it's becoming one certainly very fast, um, that these institutions uh, could have implemented in their surveys a validity study. So EVS, I know, and ESS in Europe, so uh, European Social Survey and European Value Survey, I believe do this so they they have uh, very advanced methodological um, uh, pushes for the scales in which are applied in their surveys so uh, i my recommendation would be to be more like ESS in this sense uh, and please let me know if i answered your question uh, there's a part of theory there um so i just want to say that um uh, to address the theory part it's one of our recommendations for sure to have a measure that is specific to a theory. And obviously uh, that theory would give enough, uh, um, um, enough information for us to test the boundary conditions under which uh, uh, the measure works and doesn't. Great. Um, we have um, uh, another question from Alexandre. Uh, Avaliani, Alexandra Avaliani, uh, thanks. First of all, uh, if I may deviate slightly, I want to ask you about one problem. Most items uh, cherry pick a uh, few items from plenty, 100 or more political topics and issues, and assume that ideology is a reflective construct. 
often this is the case. One may, may one may deduct with average certainty some someone's stance uh, on topics from few questions, but mostly people are not diehard fanatic fans of ideologies and thus have specific stance on issues and thus have, for instance, a very left leaning uh, position on some issues and opposite on others. I think that was more of a comment. So let yeah. me try to, to, to address the comment. Um, I believe uh, Alexander is correct uh, in saying that um, uh, the majority of scales are what we called on the fly. So they pick items uh, from uh, these surveys and they derive different scales. Uh, there's evidence, uh, for example, um, the papers of Feldman and Johnson, 2014, uh, Carmine's uh, and all, which is a series of studies in political uh, science on ideology, as well as Trier and Hilligas, they not only talking about, they are all talking about the same topic, which is ideology in mass public, but they are using the same data from 2000. So the ANES from 2000, and they arrive um, at, at, I wouldn't say widely different conclusions, but they arrive at different conclusions, uh, somewhat, especially uh, when it comes to, to correlates. So we are conducting a replication on, on these studies. Uh, with the same data and different data to show uh, the extent to which uh, dimensionality, for example, which is a hot topic in ideology, um, is variant towards measurement. It, it varies across uh, uh, scales and methods, right? So uh, absolutely, uh, this is indeed the case. Now, as for reflective, um, I don't know a method of, of deciding if it's a network model, if it's a, a, a reflective, and I always forget the other one, oh my God. Um, mm, uh, I always forget the, the SES one. <laughs> um, and to me, at least as I read the literature, it's more of a theoretical assumption about what you believe your construct to be. So I, I wouldn't know how to test that, but for, uh, for most people, I would agree with you that no, it's very difficult to find IRs in ideology, but I would argue uh, based on critical literature that the extent to which ideology pervades our uh, lives is very large, uh, maybe not to the policy preference level, but certainly to the values we hold, certainly to the, uh, to the systems we help uh, uh, uphold. So um, I do believe ideology is well spread among all of us, right? So there's, I could give many examples of the way different societies think, but in the case of the US, um, uh, there's always uh, um, the idea of profit is very important. Uh, you have a system in the US that is very neoliberal in which it's important to, whenever we talk about social programs, we talk about, uh, uh, we, we rarely ever consider the benefits and helping people are more concerned uh, with uh, its consequences to the debt or we're consequence whether that will uh, uh, influence negatively our ability to generate uh, uh, um, job jobs or etc. So um, yeah, so I think ideology does pervade our thinking in many ways. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Flavio, and uh, thank you for all um, for, the, for the questions and uh, comments. Yeah. Now Could we I ask to move on. Yeah. Could I ask him uh, just a final question. Uh, yeah, sure. I, was okay. just wondering, I was just wondering how how has your 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 research been received by the some of the authors from from these uh, studies? Have they commented on your research on this? Um, I believe I talked to Feldman and Justin who are support. Yeah, the mostly supportive. Yeah, the, uh, um, yeah. L let, let me just see again in case I'm committing any sort of uh, 
faux pas here, but I don't think so. So we, obviously we were never able to be in contact with the first two authors, but we did contact the Peer Research Center, uh, uh, um, Yes, and Feldman and Johnson and Inbar. Yeah, we talked to Inbar, Pizarro and Bloom and Everett. Yeah, so they are all supported. Uh, I think everybody recognizes the need for, for this kind of studies. And we, we, we took special care to not to make it about the authors because it's not about them. They are embedded in, into a system of practices and incentives. And what we're trying to show is that altogether, we need a collective effort towards the improvement of science uh, towards a uh, more cumulative science. Thank you. So now we uh, we need to move on. Um, thank you so much, uh, Flavia, for joining us, and thanks to to all for coming today. Uh, thank you to Oliver uh, and Edona who have been helping behind the scenes and making all this uh, possible for us. Uh, so this talk will be uploaded on uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, and I also want to say that uh, I encourage you to check uh, our upcoming Riot's talks on our website and, uh, and Twitter. We'll see you again next time. Bye.